So hello everyone, welcome uh, our next speaker in Security Dev Room, Lorenzo Fontana, and his talk about uh, Falco Internals 101. Hey, um, I feel a lot of pressure just because, I mean, it's Saturday and it's lunchtime, so you're all here to listen to this, so you know, it's very, very, it's a very, very high pressure situation. So we are been, we're going to talk about the Falco project and how we have been able to put syscalls to user space, bring syscalls to user space in a very fast way with very low throughput. The thing is that I didn't really want to talk about the Falco project, which is the CNCF project I work on, but while doing it, I actually discovered that we have been making something very interesting for everyone to listen to, so I actually wanted to, to tell everyone. Um, if you already knew me, uh, it would be probably because of my book, Linux Observability with BPF, and maybe because you're involved in the Kubernetes space or Cloud Native space in some way, and also because I've been engaged with FOSDEM for the past five years probably. First things first, I, will, I want to give you some context to, to let you understand. Falco is a project that basically takes every syscall that happens. Why no one is laughing at that? I mean, <laughs> every syscall is brought to user space, and with those syscalls, Falco process a set of rules that again gives you alerts based on uh, what happened in the system. It has been started four years ago, and two years ago it had been donated to the CNCF uh, so that everyone could contribute and make it better. It's written in C++, which is, uh, already makes it crazy enough. But we wanted to add syscalls. Syscalls are a very interesting mechanism. It's an API to the kernel. It abstracts the, dry, uh, the, the, the hardware to you so that you can just do things without actually destroying this machine, and you can interact with the kernel. If you think about syscalls, whenever you open a file, a syscall is done. Whenever you establish a connection, a syscall is done. Whenever you do anything, a syscall is done. Even if you use a very high level language, at some point, a syscall is done. And the syscall interface might be abstracted by libraries like glibc, these things. Syscalls are very scary. Whenever, whatever library that deals with syscall will have to actually map every single syscall to, to deal with that. And this already makes uh, this already creates a very high bar for, every, for any security implication. Because if you have a kernel and you have syscalls, the next kernel version will have you know, maybe a new syscall, maybe a new parameter, maybe a syscall changed version, these kind of things. Um, if I keep saying the words with ed suffix like change it, it's because I'm Italian and I do that and I cannot deal with that, so sorry. Syscalls are very powerful are very good for kernel space, but are not very, very good for user space. To bring every syscall to user space, guess what you have to do? A syscall. So <laughs> it's already, you know, a, a, very, a very hard problem. It's like the kitchen and the egg. And uh, if you don't believe me that the problem is hard, try to have a system with, you know, a throughput of five millions of syscalls at a second. It's crazy. You have five millions of syscalls, and another five million of syscalls to actually deal with the syscalls, so, and, and so on. And it's not 1998 anymore. I mean, it was like five, but um, the kernel was very, very simple back then. Things like multi-threading and stuff. And you really need to know that when you want to deal with syscalls, and when you do a security tool in general, you also have to deal with time. And guess what you need to deal with time? A syscall. Nice. Or you can deal with things like, you know, registers, like you can go get the time from the processor, but processors are not abstracted. So you have to deal with time for every single architecture you want to support. And it's another maze, like this place. And also, if that wasn't enough, syscalls are not enough. Uh, because you get a syscall that tells you, hey, someone opened this file with these permissions. Thank you. But uh, we are in a different world that 10 years ago was like, 
1998 is not any more than years ago. Uh, we're in a different world than 20 years ago. And you uh, don't have just a system that runs Apache with some PHP. You might have containers, so you have a very complex infrastructure. And you want to know in which container this is going happen, in which network namespace. If the network namespace was, in, with, was with a mount namespace or if the attacker actually you know, did something nasty, maybe they changed the, changed the C group of the network namespace, these kind of things. So having container information is also useful. And for container information, you have to deal with systems that are very slow because you are going to take the container information from the, con the Docker daemon or from container D or something like with their API. And those are APIs designed to go at, you know, with a latency of 100 milliseconds. But syscalls are very fast, 5 million a second. And you want to correlate every syscall to, it's crazy. To every, I mean, we didn't solve this problem yet in a very good way. So how to do that? Um, we've been asking ourselves this question. There's a third answer that we didn't develop yet, but it's, it's secret. And basically two ways. So you just implement your own kernel module. <laughs> like, you know, it's like when you install VirtualBox in your Linux machine and then you need to, you know, you need to restart. Nice. <laughs> or when you upgrade your kernel, when you install some modules, imagine having your company with 100 servers, fuck updates, restarts the machines. And that wasn't very handy, so we also implemented an eBPF probe, which everyone knows what is it, because my talk is not on eBPF, and I didn't want to explain. And do you know eBPF? Okay, great. Um, like 20%, so I, I will explain very fast. So with a kernel module, you can just go in the kernel, implement your code, and you know it will do whatever you want. Pros, you implement whatever you want, it's very efficient. Cons, it will kernel panic your machine, and then as soon as you do a mistake, your servers are all down, um, and you don't have a way to reboot them, and you know it's very hard. Um, with an MBPF probe, the mechanism is a bit more sophisticated, you can't implement whatever you want because there are some limitations, but you can still go to the kernel and ask for information in a very efficient way. So how does this look like? Um, well, um, uh, I initially wanted to do this presentation in the terminal, then it turns out that I had to do diagrams. Um, so my diagrams are not very good, but um, I mean, gives an idea. So you have the kernel space and user space separated you have the kernel module on the lower bound and you have bulk on the upper bound. And in the middle, there are a set of libraries and tools that you know, allow you to process the syscall in a very efficient way. Let's start from the, from the bottom. The kernel module is the first implementation. It's still there and still works with Falco. And it basically goes uh, to the kernel and attached to every syscall that gets executed when it starts executing and when it exits the execution. Like imagine putting a uh, a jump at the start of every function and a jump at the end of every function that uh, executes the syscalls. That's it. When this code executes, it sends it to a ring buffer, which we're going to be talking later, that then is consumed in user space for a file descriptor, you know, like a device, uh, like the device of your printer, because this is a kernel module. And then uh, this is consumed by another library that enriches all this stuff with container metadata and stuff, which is called libscenes. We will talk about this more in details later. And then Falco can, you know, match rules. So, <laughs> this is crazy. Uh, first things, uh, a ring buffer. Uh, a ring buffer is a data structure that is basically, imagine a linked list, but that links to itself. Uh, this is to avoid that you have to, what's happening with the microphone? Uh, this is to avoid that you have to actually uh, shuffle back the buffer to the point, to the starting point of the execution so that you can continue putting elements and, you know, the last element 
was over, uh, was overwritten, like uh, first in, first out queue. And um, in Falco, we decided the perfect size would have been eight megabytes for it, because it fits well in uh, most of registers. Uh, it's very uh, handy to, to use uh, both from kernel space and both from user space. Uh, most users that have very strange use case, they adjust this, but it's a compile time thing. Uh, I personally never had a problem. The kernel takes the events and it mem copy the event to the next pointer in the ring buffer. That's why this is fast. Uh, so the memory is never uh, ever copied. It's just copying the pointer of the memory. Sorry, I, I took the wrong thing and I contradicted myself. Uh, the memory of the uh, the pointer is copied to the ring buffer so that you have access to that memory. And at that point, you can uh, load this data from user space by reading the dev falco zero uh, files. Um, this is basically how the structs looks in uh, the its header file. And these other files shared between the user space and kernel space. So you basically, what's in, what you're interested in, it's in the head and the tail. And then there's some uh, metadata for, for you to understand if your ring buffer is performing well. Um, I'm showing this because, uh, I mean, we are all used to very high level code. I mean, object-oriented programming, all of that stuff, you know, functional programming, all the interesting things that I love. But when you have to do these kind of things, you actually have to, you, you have no choice than designing a structure that has everything in it because you have to make it fast. And so this also has the responsibility, you know, fuck the single responsibility concept, um, to, um, you know, count the dropped events, count the total number of events, count if there have been preemptions, contest switches, these kind of things. Um, drop demands happen because maybe the ring buffer is not fast enough. You remember when I said five million syscalls? Maybe at five million syscalls, events are starting getting dropped, so there's no memory free in the ring buffer to, to put them. And at that point, syscalls are not yet ready to be uh, used by, by your application because, well, you receive a pointer first. Second thing, you go to the pointer to see what's inside. There's memory. And then you look and there's only the name of the syscall and some other, um, you know, some other data that you don't understand. So we had to make a mechanism that's called fillers that basically goes to every syscall, you know, when I said, do this for five millions of syscalls. Uh -huh. And it takes, with the fancy function, syscall get arguments deprecated, because there's no other way yet. Um, it takes the registers and transforms that information to a string or to, uh, you know, in this case, that information was not there, so it, it just prints out not available, and, and then if there have been success, the syscall is enriched, still in the same data structure. So you have to do this for every syscall two times because there's the enter and the exit, and nothing, I just wanted to share this with you all because it's been painful. And at some point, you go to people, you talk with others, you find out that there's eBPF, you find out that people are very upset about having to compile their kernel module all the times, and you decide to do this with eBPF again. And it turns out that it's a much, a much nicer experience. There's no uh, ring buffer involved at all, because eBPF doesn't allow you, you know, to do advice and you know, move memory from kernel space to user space, because the purpose of it being safe will be totally, you know, will be totally useless, but it has a set of concepts that allow you to do that in fancy ways that are called maps. And in this case, libscap, 
which was the library that before was just reading the file descriptor, loads an eBPF program to kernel space and says to the kernel, hey, kernel, takes this object that I compiled for you. And the kernel says, yes. And then the kernel says, oh, yes, I like this. And then the kernel says, OK, I will send you data. And you know, the, all this conversation was the eBPF verifier, which basically makes sure that you don't mess up with the kernel. And at that point, data flows to libscap through eBPF maps. And guess what we had to do to do the fillers? We had to tell, this is very, very nice. We had to tell to libscap to actually send eBPF programs in the map for the kernel to load them at runtime when they're needed. I mean, you have to see the code. It's very fine. And, and these make sure that, again, every syscall is matched to the right arguments. All the blob data becomes, you know, um, strings. And you have, I mean, if you look at the Chmod syscall, you don't want uh, the, you know, hexadecimal representation of the, the permission. You want to see, uh, you want to see these to 0777. Or do you want, you want to see the actual name of the constant, like uh, you want to see SUID, right? <clears throat> and to come back to libscap, just to, to explain better, uh, what this does, it basically maintains the control loop uh, through the kernel module and to the BPF map, because when you read from that file, you know, it's a device. So you continue have to read, right? Because you need to consume it or you lose it. And when you do a security software, you cannot lose data, right? You cannot just, oh, I'm not reading it for a while, so that. And, you know, attacker, very, very, very happy about you not doing that. So it has the responsibility to do that. And uh, we had to actually do a library that does that because the attack surface of that library alone would have to be very, very small. It would have to be just some lines of code. Because at that point, since that you know, does the enrichment, we're going to the next slide, has a lot of you know, code that talks with container runtimes and you know, other parts that you know, might be compromised. And this also does a very nice thing, which is the SCAP format, which is a file that you basically uh, can write and read. It's a format. So you can avoid when you need to test uh, dealing with syscall, you can avoid to have a real kernel. You can just write and read from this file. And then again, CINSP does the container runtime metadata. And I said this is in C++, so we basically had to rewrite the client for every container runtime. Nice. And um, Kubernetes metadata and filtering. And this is essentially what Falco is. Uh, well, it's much more than this because it, this won't be, the project would not exist. But <laughs> it's just a main with a while loop that has an event called since event here. And every time uh, there's, that we go to the next iteration, the pointer is re reset and sent to the next event. And then the Falco engine applies the rules, the Falco rules to this event to match. And there was a treat. And if you want to see a Falco rule, is it still OK to see? Yes. This is how it looks like. So you have the rule name. It's very, it's very fancy. Uh, YAML. No one looks at YAML. Oh my gosh. And that's the description of the rule. And then there's a condition. So in this case, um, we, let me find a very easy one. Uh, I don't want one with a macro, because if not, I have to expand the macro. OK. OK, this is a perfect condition. So this, in this case, um, we have a macro, which can, we can use you know, to avoid repeating writing, uh, to avoid repeating to write the same thing. 
and it matches to the event type execv. So whenever someone executes a process with execv sysql um, with direction to the left, so when the sysql starts executing, it will uh, actually match and go to the next condition. So that's why we needed to do all this crazy stuff. Another important thing uh, when you deal with syscalls and when you deal with having to bring them to user space, that was one of the mistakes we've been doing, we've been doing earlier, was to actually send all the Cisco. That was the initial point of my presentation. You don't actually have to. You just send the syscalls that match the conditions. So what we did at some point was to take some parts of the filtering mechanism and bring them as close as possible to kernel space so that we could actually just take out the syscall that we needed with the arguments that we needed, okay? Because maybe there are five million syscalls, but we are interested in opens of this file. And to summarize, you really want to do an eBPF probe when you do a project that does something like this because implementing your own kernel module is never a good idea. And uh, having very well-defined boundaries and interfaces is always a good idea because uh, you, can, you can work on something that you, and that's very well-defined again. Like, as, as I said, the SCAP format is very useful because you can use that format even to send data to another server in, in your infrastructure. So it's, it's very easier to you know, make anything on top of that, like a user interface, like Wireshark, right? Wireshark basically used the pickup format. I could make a Wireshark-like interface for the SCAP format, for example. And uh, if you're interested in learning more, because 25 minutes, I guess it's not enough, uh, and also I speak very slowly, you can uh, join the community or uh, go to the website or uh, find me on my email or um, don't do anything because you're not interested. And thanks. We might have time for one or two questions if they will not be too far. Hello. I will try. Scream. Hello. Uh, what is the performance impact on uh, running Falcon on uh, your machine? Okay. That's the first question, and the second question is, if uh, something matches the filter, is there, is there any way to have an action to take place right away instead of a simple output or something bad happen? Okay, Thank I'll you. start with the second question. Uh, the second question was, uh, there's any way to do an action when something happens, like, you know, doing uh, prevention, um, like C Linux or something like that? Well, with custom code. and. Uh, there's not, actually. Falco is not a framework to design uh, you know, a prevention mechanism. It's just detection. So it will tell you when something happens. It's in, you know, in that kind of uh, segment of security software where it only tells you, hey, there's someone poking you, you know, mining uh, some bitcoins on your machine, but it doesn't actually stop the miner from happening. It will send those data to, uh, you know, uh, a server like you know a collection mechanism that you use and with those information you can actually take action like it, either manually or with a script or with whatever you want and the first question was what's the performance impact of running Falcon machine uh, the performance impacts are very different based on the rules you apply uh, on most of the machines that I personally use because it's an open source project and I don't actually have you know myself uh, production machines, but you know the users have. And what I've been noticing in the issue and in the community calls was that it was around one or two percent of the CPU usage. Well, we are almost out of, the, out of the time, so if you've got some other question, please uh, talk. Uh, to Lorenzo after the talk. <laughs>